I'm Susan Schneider. I'm director of the LLM program right now, for those of you that, that, that I haven't met. Uh, and it's really my honor today to introduce our distinguished speakers and to provide you with a little bit of information about the current LLM program and what we're doing right now that is uh, all built upon the foundation that these three gentlemen created for us. Um, when the LLM, was, LLM program was first created over 30 years ago now, American agriculture was in the throes of an economic crisis, and attorneys turned to the LLM program for the expertise that was really needed to address the vexing legal issues uh, that faced farm and agribusiness clients. And these issues are still very important, and that's still a role that the LLM program can serve. Today, however, many of the significant issues that are facing farmers and agribusinesses raise issues of sustainability, our food system, food policy, how do we produce our food, what are the social and environmental costs, how do we feed an increasing world population in the face of climate change, how can consum consumers learn more about the food that, they're, that they produce, and how can we reconnect those consumers to the agricultural system that feeds them. Again, attorneys are turning to the University of Arkansas School of Law and its LLM program for this expertise. And one of the delights of my job every year is to welcome a new class of talented attorneys that are really excited to be here and studying issues that they really can't access anywhere else. I hope everybody has an opportunity to pick up the flyer that we have on the bios of this year's class because we've got a tremendous class coming in, uh, lots of good expertise, good experience, and I know it's going to be a great year for us. Our classes this year reflects the, the current classes where there are a dynamic mix of farm kids and city kids, traditional agricultural law interests, and progressive food policy interests. We bring together diverse groups of people that need to talk to each other and that need to understand each other better. And we're just delighted to be able to have that opportunity uh, here at Arkansas. But we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be doing any of the work that we're doing today if it wouldn't, be, have, if it wouldn't have been for the three speakers that I would like to present to you today. It was their leadership, foresight, dedication, and sometimes tenacity that came that, that brought about the wonderful LLM program that they created for us. And with that, I will just introduce the three speakers, and then I'm just going to sit down and listen to the show. <laughs> uh, first, we have uh, Judge Jake Looney. And when the faculty of the University of Arkansas School of Law voted in uh, 1980, to, or I guess it was the first vote was in 1978, you know how things take a while in the university process, um, to set up an LLM program in agricultural law. The person that they looked to do that was Jake Looney, who at that time was um, teaching at Virginia Tech, I believe, the very distinguished exper uh, background already in agricultural law, uh, with master's degrees from the University of Missouri, Columbia in animal science, and a master's in ag economics, his JD from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and he had taught at the University of Missouri, Virginia Tech, and Kansas State before coming here to Arkansas to join our faculty and to take on the huge task of setting up the LLM program. Some current news that I just have to share with you, bringing us up right to the future. Um, judge Looney now has been serving here as a circuit judge for a number of years. He recently had his dissertation approved in the Judicial Studies program at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, this is a program that's offered in conjunction with the National Judicial College, and he's soon going to be awarded his PhD, the only judge in Arkansas to have completed this program. So he's very, very proud. Next to Jake, we have Neil Hamilton, and I feel like I've introduced Neil Hamilton so many times this week <laughs> that I haven't almost memorized. Um, Neil is the Dwight D. Opperman Chair of Law at the Drake University School of Law in Des Moines. He also serves as the Director of the Drake Agricultural Law Center, which itself will be celebrating an anniversary coming up the, this year, 30th 
year. Um, Neil has done tremendous work in agricultural law over the years. Um, when Jake began to set up the LLM program, he reached out and Neil was the first professor that he hired to come here and teach. And I think that, and since that time, Neil has continued in his leadership in agricultural law. He's lectured throughout the United States and in, a, in at least 20 other countries. He's been teaching agricultural law now for over 30 years, written more than two dozen law review articles and a number of books on food and agricultural law issues. We're delighted that Neil comes back every year to teach our introduction to agricultural and food law in the LLM class, and then he comes back around in the spring to teach a course on rural development, rural lands, and um, rural livelihoods that, that picks up on many of the emerging issues coming to agriculture. And then now next I would like to introduce Professor Don Peterson, who was the director of the LLM <laughs> program when I was in the program. And the, the greatest joy of all of the LLM students that I knew in that time period was to just see if we could come close to meeting Don Peterson's <laughs> expectations of us. We, we sometimes didn't do as well as others, but he was always very patient with us and very understanding and always, the most important thing I think is that he always really believed in us and we all struggled to meet that level of, of uh, possibility. He has his BA from St. Olaf in Minnesota, a former Minnesotan I would add, a JD from Northwestern, he had practical experience uh, representing farmers in uh, small towns in Minnesota and I think that that experience always filtered into his excellent teaching. He taught at William Mitchell and at Capital University, and when Jake was um, recruited to, he couldn't stay very long as director of the LLM program because we needed him as dean of the law school. So he was uh, moved from that position up to dean of the law school, and then we needed a director for the LLM program, and it was Professor Peterson from Capital that we recruited. And I should mention, one of the great uh, tributes to Professor Peterson is this phenomenal case book um, in agricultural law, which he wrote with uh, Professor Meyer and Professor Thorson and Professor John Davidson. And we're delighted to have also in our midst a person who was extremely important to the development of the LLM program as well, Mary Berry, now Mary Jensen, who typed every word. <laughs> So with that, I would like to just turn the program over to this very distinguished panel and to have a chance to um, formally thank them for all of their efforts, because none of us would be here without them. Well, I guess I get to go first, uh, I guess because I was the first one here, but uh, Susan suggested that, that I talk a little bit about what got me into agricultural law and then the the the, the basis of the program I, I i do want to say this is just so refreshing for me uh, i'm the only judge in a two-county circuit in arkansas so that means that i spend most of my time listening to people fight over bird houses and 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 <laughs> and recliners and whose whose dog did what to who and well Larry Froelich can do a program on dog bites if y'all ever need one. He, he is the guy on dog bites. Uh, but it's, it's nice to be here and to, to relive some memories and see so many of you that, uh, that I enjoyed working with. Uh, as as uh, Susan suggested, my, my interest in, in law came a little bit late because I actually started out in animal science with a plan to go to vet school and was at the University of Missouri and planning to uh, finish a master's in animal science and go to vet school, and one of the requirements they had there was that you had to take a course outside the sciences, and they had an agricultural law course, University of Missouri, in the Ag Econ Department, that had been around for a long time, and I took that course, and I can remember coming home, and, and Ira, my wife, after listening through a lot of this, would, said to me once, you're gonna end up going to law school, aren't you? <laughs> No, 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 I, I, I'm, this, this is just interesting stuff. Well, by that fall, I had uh, enrolled in law school and <laughs> changed, uh, changed my whole program. Interestingly enough, before I finished law school, 
the uh, person who had been teaching that course in Missouri I wanted to go back and do some graduate work, and I had the opportunity to go back and teach the course that that started my interest in this whole thing, and and so that's that's kind of where I went from. Interestingly enough, about that time, and we're talking about in the late '70s, there was this this developing interest in the the overlap of law and agriculture. Uh, it was about that time that uh, one of Don's colleagues, Dale Dahl, and some other folks uh, around the country begin to talk about, well, there's enough of us, maybe we could create a, an organization, a group. And so some of us met first in Chicago and then later in Minnesota to uh, create what became the American Agricultural Law Association. And then as Susan suggested, our faculty here, the faculty here decided in the late 70s that they would like to get into graduate legal education and had a lot of debates as to what field could Arkansas do that would be appropriate for this part of the world, but also within the resources that might be available. And uh, a couple of the faculty members just kind of threw out, they'd heard a little bit about what was going on, threw out the idea of agricultural law. Drew Kershaw, who was teaching then at the University of Oklahoma, uh, Mr. Enthusiasm, if any of you know Drew, uh, was asked to come over and, and speak to the faculty about agricultural law. What is this thing, agricultural law? Well, by the time Drew left, they were convinced it was the greatest thing <laughs> that could ever be offered because he had them convinced that, that you know, it was the coming. Well, so they decided to establish the program. And as Susan said, I, was, I had been teaching at the undergraduate level and, and came in with the, with the job of creating the program. And I spent that first year uh, traveling around the country, talking to people at other law schools, recruiting. Uh, also talking to a lot of people as, uh, uh, that were in the field just as to what should be in an LLM program in agricultural law. And uh, as a result, kind of did uh, course development and put together uh, the first package of courses. We, we kind of made one little commitment at that time, and Terry and Linda were unfortunately the ones that were the guinea pigs of this, and that was we said, we want a program that when the students come here, they will say two things when they leave. One is, I never worked that hard in my whole life. And two, it was worth it. And we structured the program with that in mind. And at that time, uh, we had a, a thesis requirement for every student. And that's why I was laughingly saying Terry was number one, because actually Terry was the first student to finish all the requirements and got his thesis done. Linda was not far behind uh, and the other people in that class. but. We started out with that in mind, and uh, so my first year was recruiting a, a, a class, recruiting a faculty member. <laughs> and I'm a, no, yeah, Neil has, of course, claimed a lot of the credit. Uh, if you if you look, a lot of times in the footnote, he'll say he was a founding member of the faculty for the. LLM program at University of Arkansas. That's how it's worded. Yeah, you know, I know. It closely. I told Neil, one of the things I taught him as a young faculty member, I said, Neil, one of the things you want to do in all your articles is be sure you cite yourself at least once. So if you notice, read any of his articles, he always cites himself at least one time. Now, I thought that the was cite, within the first footnote. Well, usually the first footnote. The cite may actually have nothing to do with that article. <laughs> But it gets his name out there, and, uh, and so, you know, he learned that lesson well. Uh, we we uh, then, Neil and I, then had the responsibility for uh, teaching the first class and, and trying out those courses, and we had to, over time, tweak them, and, 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 and we, we had another idea, too, and I think that's illustrated a little bit about by the uh, discussions from the speakers here today. Uh, somebody said, well, what are you, what are you what do you mean when you say agricultural law? And so we sort of came up, and I think we actually stole it from Don's book, if you want to know the truth. But the idea was that if it's an area of law that's unique to agriculture, then that's easy. That's agricultural law. But there are a lot of areas of law that are not unique to agriculture, but they have unique effects on agriculture because of what agriculture is all about. And so we kind of took those two things as the as the founding direction is what we would try to do. And I remember, Neil, one time we were in, uh, I think it was Fort Worth, one of the ag law meetings, and we're kind of doing some kind of program on agricultural law, and, and I made some comment about the direction, and somebody said, well, what are you going to do about your program 
if agriculture changes? And I said, well, we just changed the name of the program. Which apparently you've done, Susan. And I, I, you know, nobody asked me if you could change the name of the program, but apparently you did it. But that's, that's the great part about it. It's, it's been flexible enough to, to try some things, and some things have worked, and some things have been discarded, and new things come in, and uh, that uh, ha has been great. Neil's going to talk about how he ended up on the faculty, and I'm going to let him tell that story, but I'll add to it a little bit. But <laughs> when, when the faculty took leave of their senses and asked me to be dean, <laughs> much over Jim Miller's objection, I might add, <laughs> but, uh, I started looking around for somebody else that we could bring in, and, and of course, Don's work just popped right to the, the top, and, and uh, I was telling him, reminding him, I you know, deans are supposed to do this. I don't know if they do it anymore or not, uh, Dean Leeds, but you're supposed to, if you're going to try to recruit a faculty member from another law school, you really ought to talk to their dean before <laughs> you do that. Uh, it's kind of like coaches, you know, you don't. And so I called up uh, uh, Don's dean at Capitol, and I said, uh, you know, I, I told him, I said, we haven't talked to Don yet, but I'd really like to be able to... Uh, talk to Don about coming to join our program. I thought he was going to have a heart attack right on the spot because he said, oh, no, no, please. He's my best faculty member. Don't take him away. Well, we did, and <laughs> we were happy to have him. Uh, now, that about that time, as Neil will tell you the rest of his story, is about the time uh, Neil had the opportunity to go back to Iowa. I will tell you this much about uh, my, my finding of Neil. I found Neil in a cubby hole in the Iowa Attorney General's office, back in a corner, with just kind of little cardboard walls up there. I don't know. Partitions. Partitions, I guess. And I think he was so happy to get out of that little cubby hall that <laughs> it wouldn't matter what I offered him, he would have come. <laughs> in any event, that's that's how it started. It was it was a great time. Uh, we we I think the success to be, and I'm absolutely sincere, and I say this for all the the former students here the success of the program it wasn't us it was the students that we brought here and the fact that we were able to identify and find quality folks who wanted to take this seriously and to pitch in and study hard and to do uh, what now a whole generation or two <laughs> I guess we're about ready to start recruiting kids of some of the graduates aren't we uh, Susan yeah but that, that's been it, and, and it, it, it was just a great time, and uh, I have been so uh, pleased to see the program prosper and continue. Uh, with that, I'll shut up. I may have a few comments later, but Neil's got a couple of things that he may want to say. Well, first, I, I certainly want to well, thank Susan and the dean and all of you. And uh, it's, uh, It took a long time to do it, but it's great to have a, a, a reunion opportunity like this. And I want to echo Jake that... It was the students then, and it's certainly the students uh, now that are really the driving force and the value of the, of the program. And that's one of the things you learn after you teach for a while. It doesn't matter how many dozen law review articles or books you wrote. That the real, to the extent you leave a mark, it's the students that uh, you have the opportunity to to be involved with. You know, agricultural law in many ways led me to law school. Uh, I was a farm boy and worked for Congressman Harkin, went to Iowa State, got a degree in forestry. And, they and each, studied that one tree we, in they, Iowa they over gave and us, over. They yeah. gave us, as Jake reminds me, they gave us each a tree. And uh, <laughs> But I took an agricultural law class from Neil Harrell, who's a name that's well-known and, and well-respected. And... Uh, I went to the University of Iowa Law School, and the University of Iowa, in fact, had an agricultural law program all during the 1960s into the early 70s. Uh, that was in part why Neil went there. Uh, the sign for it's in my office at Drake because I took it after I left when I found it in the closet. Uh, but when I was in law school, as I tell the students, you never heard anything about a farmer unless one got hit by a truck. Uh, and I tried to make an agricultural law uh, you know, tried to do independent studies and wrote an article while I was there. It was first in the Ad Advocate magazine, yes. and then we were published it in the journal called The Importance of Agriculture Law in the Law School Curriculum. And it was basically a blueprint for why a public university in particular should have an agricultural law program. And then went to work for the Iowa Attorney General's Office in the Farm Division, where 
this cubby hole that Jake found me. And one of my professors at, at uh, Iowa and then colleagues at uh, the university was also had been a professor here and was a close friend of Dick Atkinson's, and that was Bess Ozenbaugh. And uh, Bess one day told me, she says, oh, you know, I've heard that the University of Arkansas is going to create an, uh, an LLM program in, Arcan or in agricultural law. And I've told you already I'm a little Iowa-centric, and I can remember what I thought. What in the hell, Arkansas? You know, what? And then somebody, she said, well, my gosh, you know, they've got chickens and they've got all this stuff. And said, okay. You know, and so and about that time, I get a phone call from Jake Looney. And Jake says, I'm going to be in Des Moines, and I want to tell you about this LLM program, and I want to talk to you about it. And you're going to be around such and such. And I said, okay. And I got off the phone, and I talked to Earl Willits, who was my boss, and I said, Earl, I said, Jake's going to be in town. He wants to talk to me about this LLM program. I don't know whether he wants to, me to be a student in it or whether he wants me to teach in it. And so like, <laughs> Jake called back, and I said, why do you want to talk to me again? <laughs> and he said, oh, no, he wants you to consider being a professor. And so I flew down to Fayetteville. On my birthday, I was here, I'll never forget, it was January 22nd, 1981. It was like 70 degrees. It took me to B&B, &B, yeah. and we had barbecue, right. and Whataburger probably too, and maybe Herman's while we were at it. And uh, I... Uh, and I took him I, down to the farm, and... That's right. That's right. And it, and it was it quite did. an impression on the locals, because they'd never seen a guy in designer jeans before. <laughs> They, they were Levi's. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> well, they, were not. they weren't they big were, gyms or whatever. Were, right? were, yeah. But anyway, I, I should say, you know, I was only here for two years, so I'm the thin I'm the thin filling in this sandwich of knowledge, so I won't make this very long. But I had the great opportunity to be hired and come down here. And of course this program and Jake was sincere about how we work people and God, they took thirty credits in this thesis. And uh, as a new professor, he said, okay, here's your two classes you're going to teach each semester. Well, these were all brand new classes. I'd never taught them. Well, nobody had ever taught them. <laughs> there were no case books. So it was a little bit challenging, right? And if you see the picture, I was fairly young, 27. Most of the students were, I'd been practiced longer than I'd been out. I'd been out of law school for two years. And so I developed four new classes during the first year when I was teaching. It was only later when I've been on the hiring committee, and you talk about hiring people, and they said, well, can I have some relief semester so I can prepare my new class? I'm like, what do you mean? I didn't even know that was an option. <laughs> and, but, so I didn't have that option. And so I was here and uh, taught and uh, had only been here right for a year, and then uh, the opportunity for Jake to become dean uh, came up. I managed his campaign uh, <laughs> successfully. Uh, my work was done, and I moved back to Iowa. Dake became dean. I moved back to Iowa. But you know, the truth is, we both cleared out of the agricultural law program because we didn't want to be around to be compared to Don Peterson <laughs> because he was such a hard worker and a cranker that we said, whoa. And so Jake, Jake went to the dean's office. I went north where most stuff from Arkansas didn't get that far because the mail didn't go. And, uh, but uh, I've always been, let me say, an end in seriousness. I'm so proud and thankful and lucky to have started my career here and to remain a friend of the law school. Drake and Arkansas have had a wonderful uh, linked and strong relationship and a partnership over the last uh, 30 uh, some years. And agricultural law has been very good to all of us and it'll be very good to uh, uh, many of you. And with that, I wanna hear the real history of when the program got off and running after we got out and running. So Don, let me turn it over to you. <laughs> Well, a couple of uh, preliminary remarks. First, Corrections, uh, maybe. <laughs> well, no, actually, I, uh, uh, some of this early history is very interesting to me because I, I wasn't here. And, uh, uh, but uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, my wife, Audrey, had planned to be here today, but she landed in the um, hospital on Wednesday uh, with uh, irregular heartbeat and so forth and went through so procedures, uh, transesophageal Ill, like echocardiogram and then uh, cardioversion where they stop your heart and shock, shock it, try and get it. But, and I brought her home this noon, so I, we're living up in Pea Ridge now, so I made a trip to 
Washington Regional and got her home, got back in the car, got down here. And, uh, if I don't look too sharp today, uh, <laughs> it's because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Another preliminary remark, you were talking about dogs and Larry Froelich. I remember his principal paper for the LLM program. <laughs> when can the farmer shoot the dog? <laughs> That's right. That was it. That was right. <laughs> uh, it, it just shows you the breadth of oh. our culture. <laughs> you know, so, um, well, Susan had uh, had asked all of us, I guess, to. to tell a little how we got interested in agriculture and agricultural law. And of course, my story is very different uh, than Jake's story or Neil's story. Uh, my, my father was a Lutheran minister and after World War II, a Veterans Administration chaplain. My mother's father was a Lutheran minister and had brothers who were Lutheran ministers and it just goes uh, clergyman, clergyman, clergyman. Uh, so I didn't grow up on any farm. And, uh, 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 but what happened was that uh, uh, I landed jo a job with the U.S. Forest Service uh, in the um, uh, working in the summer of 1957 on the Canixi National Forest uh, in northern Idaho. That's right up by the Canadian border. And uh, we were dealing with disease control, blister rust, fungus, attacks and kills the western white pine, various methods of uh, dealing with that disease, uh, <coughs> uh, including chemical treatment of trees, things like actinodione and phytoactin, and, and some summers fighting forest fires all over western Montana and Idaho and eastern Washington and so forth. And it sure did get me interested in, in forestry issues, uh, both public and, and, uh, and private. Uh, but... Uh, Should have gone to Iowa State and studied that tree. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've been a, state, but uh, once uh, once uh, got through with law school uh, and uh, wanted to get into pr uh, practice, uh, uh, Audrey and I were looking around, principally in South Dakota and Minnesota, and uh, uh, didn't really want to be in the Twin Cities and so forth, although there were some good opportunities there. And I just happened to drift through the law school at the University of Minnesota and read their bulletin board outside their placement office and picked up on a vacancy in a, in a uh, law firm in Wheaton, Minnesota, which is a small town right out where Minnesota and South Dakota and North Dakota kind of come together. And it's wonderful, wonderful uh, agricultural uh, country. <coughs> and uh, uh, the firm for years had been known as Murphy, Johansson, and Winter, established in the 1890s by Frank Murphy. Uh, uh, when I joined the firm in the early 60s, it was uh, Johansson, Winter, Lundquist, and Sherwood. And I soon uh, learned that Frank Murphy, who of course had passed on years ago, 1940, had been chairman of the board of the American Council of Agriculture in 1920. He was the principal speechwriter for Al Smith in the 1928 uh, presidential campaign, and my senior partner in the law firm and my mentor, Al Winter, had worked with Frank uh, Murphy for a good many years, 1927 up until. Uh, 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 Murphy's death in 1940. And uh, so I came into this, this law firm in this wonderful small town that we were looking for, uh, and there was kind of an aura about the law office. I mean, you, you walked in, there was a big picture of Frank Murphy, among other things that I saw. And an extensive, and I mean extensive, clientele of uh, 
crop farmers and livestock operators and dairy farmers and rural banks and drainage districts and agricultural cooperatives and farm implement dealers and aerial sprayers and turkey growers with the same big houses they have down here in, uh, in Arkansas. And the Farmers Home Administration was a client. And in addition, we had a really extensive litigation and appellate practice. And we were, we were working over like 14, 15 counties, uh, and sometimes associating counsel in South Dakota and practicing over there. And I got in the midst of all of that. And uh, there's no doubt that's how I became uh, an agricultural lawyer. I mean, uh, uh, the nature of the practice and, and a wonderful mentor in, in Al Winter. Uh, I even, back in those days, had one food contamination case, but there isn't time to talk about that today. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Um, and um, uh, while I was practicing law, I got to know Dale Dahl, and you're going to, if you haven't, run into his name, you will. Uh, he was a graduate student then at the University of Minnesota. And um, he uh, was working for a PhD in agricultural economics, but he got the uh, faculty to agree that as part of his PhD work, he could do the first year of law school. And that's what he did, took the first year of law school. And I got to know Dale, and we got to be good friends, and we started uh, doing um, uh, cooperative extension programs for farmers out in rural Minnesota. Uh, and then when we both had faculty positions in the Twin Cities, we uh, started doing a lot of writing together, particularly about farm labor issues. So we really got interested in, in that. Uh, uh, and uh, then I, I came to know John Davidson, one of the co-authors of Casebook, uh, who was teaching ag law at the University of, uh, of South Dakota, when we put together our first um, agriculture and law continuing legal education event uh, in Minnesota, which was in May of 1973 in Marshall, Minnesota, and uh, got to know got to know John, uh, and. Uh, <coughs> When I started teaching in the, in the Twin Cities, one of the things that I kind of insisted upon and, uh, was, was that I'd be able to create some kind of course or seminar on agricultural law issues. And uh, it was readily accepted, although, uh, and I don't know if you gentlemen ran into this, but there, there were those who wanted to be very careful. Agricultural law, not that. Thing. I mean, what do we got next? Shoe law or... Law of the bananas, what they always say. You know, law and, bananas. Uh, <laughs> and so I had to very carefully create my, my uh, course on legal problems of agriculture and rural areas. <laughs> That's what we called it. And then I put together a seminar, Agriculture and Law Seminar, which is basically farm labor stuff. And, you know, I've been in meetings, not here in Arkansas, no. happily, but where, where uh, law faculty members would, would hear about uh, agricultural law and so forth. And think, huh, huh. What are you going to have, a course on manure law? You know, and, and uh, uh, that kind of... Uh, that kind of stuff, and, 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 and no disrespect, uh, Anil. Uh, I vividly remember one faculty member said, "Well, I guess, I guess you'll have to publish everything in, in in the Buffalo Law Review and the Drake Law Review <laughs> <laughs> and the Suffolk Law Review." Don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was uh, a certain uh, question of. Uh, of acceptance of the discipline. <laughs> and I've always uh, uh, thought that, uh, in part, that's one of the reasons, Jake, when the program was created here, uh, that the degree requirements were established as they were. Uh, 30 hours for the LLM degree, mandatory thesis, uh, 
I think, six credits. Uh, uh, I mean, it was uh, in part uh, uh, to, to give academic respectability uh, uh, to the field uh, in, that, in that way. Um, uh, but um, to the disappointment of uh, even some in this room, I know, when I got here, uh, after four years of, of, of the, having students in the program, there were four LLM graduates. That was it. Uh, and admittedly, I was kind of nasty, I suppose, at times, because I, I would call <laughs> some, of, some of you who may even be in this room who, you know, had done your year of residency and were still fooling around with your thesis and trying <laughs> to hold down a full-time job and, uh, you know, survive in this world. Uh, uh, you know, I'd get a draft of a thesis from, you know, Joel Blow or somebody. So I'd call up uh, those who were still on the phone, those who were still working on their thesis. I just got a draft, uh, a thesis from so-and-so. When am I going to see the next draft of yours? <laughs> uh, wasn't appreciated a whole lot, but... Uh, <laughs> But after four years, uh, I began to hear whispers and uh, little information circled around, uh, circulated around that the uh, University of Arkansas uh, had uh, some standards on small degree programs and that uh, graduate programs that weren't producing at least five graduates a year uh, might you know, be subject to some review, uh, not by the law school, but by the, by the higher-ups as to, to whether it economically made sense to continue to run such a, such a program. And so I took it upon myself uh, to um, look into the possibility of getting the degree requirements changed. And I checked with just about every LLM program in the country to see what the degree requirements were. I think I might have found one that had 30 as the requirement. I don't know that I found any that had a mandatory thesis. Might have, <laughs> might have, been, might have been one or so. And uh, what I was finding was that 24 credits was kind of the standard. Some with a thesis option, some with no thesis requirement at all. Uh, and so I um, took it upon myself to, and Jake will remember this and some of you will remember this because I know some of you who were in the first classes and had to do the 30 hours were not exactly impressed with my idea that we should cut back to 24 hours, uh, but I persisted. And uh, uh, sold the law faculty on the idea that uh, you know maybe we should ch change the degree requirements to 24 hours with a thesis option. I can't remember whether three or four hours would be for the thesis if one wanted to go that way, but there'd still be a substantial writing requirement, uh, either in a seminar or in research seminar two, where you'd be expected to, to, to put together at least a modest law review type article. Um, and um, I don't know how much you remember about this, Jake, but oh my. God was had an effort. I mean, I had to go over and visit with the people at the College of Agriculture because we had a really extensive relationship with College of Agriculture at that time and with, with uh, so many people there. And, uh, uh, and then the graduate school, I mean, they were providing assistantships uh, for our LLM students. 
even though we weren't exactly part of the graduate school, but nevertheless, that's where assistantship money was coming from. And I can remember uh, sitting in the office, and I think you may have been there with whoever was the dean of the graduate school. And, uh, you know, I'm not terribly impressed with this idea. And then, of course, you, you had the higher ups in the university. I mean, this sort of change would take you all the way up to the uh, the board or whatever they, they call it, uh, of, uh, the, the university as a whole. And it was kind of an exhausting uh, undertaking, but by sometime in uh, 1985, got it approved. And we uh, made the change. And so those of you who are here now can thank me. <laughs> <laughs> Except Linda and Terry, they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I graduated in 85 and turned in my 146-page thesis. I didn't know I could have skipped that part. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, <laughs> I, I, I did some calculating. I have all these notes because uh, Susan has finally gotten me to come down every year and talk to uh, talk to the students here and I have some stuff and, and I've got stuff at home but as I mentioned in, in the first four years of the program uh, we had four LLM graduates um, and somewhere in here Give me a moment, as I uh, told you, I'm not as alert today as uh, I sometimes am. Uh, I don't know where this has disappeared to, but uh, ah, let's see here. Yes, uh, the first four years, four graduates. The next six years of the program, 64 LLM <laughs> award. <laughs> so we're, we were on our way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I understand uh, uh, the concern of the uh, of those who were here at the, at the very beginning, but I just felt like something had to be done <laughs> about that. And uh, so that's one of the things I, I did. Uh, well, I can start rattling on here for an awful long time. I, uh, uh, you know, we let Don create some of his own courses too. You know, we did give him the flexibility and, and uh, I think this was about your time. I don't know. Don was teaching that class in international development. Was that what it was? And Don posted a note for the students that it said the uh, the new federal registers have arrived. They consist of twenty five thousand pages, of which we will only read a part. <laughs> <laughs> and so my point is, he may have changed the program requirements, but he didn't change the expectations of what the students were supposed to do. But now that you bring up the international side of things, <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, when I came here, all these books laying around, chicken wars and uh, mm, merchants of grain and so forth. and. Uh, and I found out that uh, this man right here had been teaching an international trade course in the first couple of years of the program, and I thought this, you know, this is powerfully important. Uh, and so um, uh, we, we, I think, got your uh, outline or, or, or whatever assignment sheets and so forth, and. Uh, uh, I didn't take it over right away. Bill Lancaster was on the faculty and the, he taught international 
transactions and so forth. So we convinced uh, Bill Lancaster to uh, <laughs> take that over, which he did for a while, then he passed away. For some reason, the faculty, I have no idea why, decided not to hire another international law teacher, uh, international trade teacher, and uh, I thought, well, this is, this is not good, and as director of the program, and Susan knows this, when you have an area of the law and, and, and nobody else wants to teach it, and it's got to be taught, the director of the program teaches it. It make a difference what it is. Or her husband, if she could, you know. Oh, yeah, well, she, yeah, you know. Uh, so I, uh, I put together uh, uh, an international ag trade uh, course, uh, three-credit course, and uh, I, I, you know, looked around to see if there were any uh, teaching materials that, that that might be useful, and I was uh, astounded uh, to uh, discover uh, a book uh, from. Matthew Bender uh, uh, called International uh, Trade, and I'm trying to remember, I have, have I've noted somewhere in here, um, the, um, uh, the guy at New York University uh, who um, put out that uh, case book, and I got a copy of it, and I got to looking at it, and his cases, the principal cases, one after another, were involving agricultural transactions, shipments of, of hops, rye, Sudanese groundnuts, <laughs> white sugar. It, it, it was uh, Andreas Lowenfeld is, is, uh, is the author of the, of the, of the case book. And, uh, he, he didn't get any uh, into any container shipment transactions. It was all bulk cargo, and so here was this book uh, that I could actually use, and, uh, <laughs> uh, which was, you know, I had a lot of other stuff that I gave the students. But uh, so I got that going, and then I got the international. Uh, trade policy seminar going, and I taught those things, and uh, uh, almost always had to teach ag finance and credit, because nobody else wanted to teach ag finance and credit. Uh, that was the way it went. Um, but um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I have uh, uh, warned Susan about that. Not to get too too carried away. <laughs> let me wear, let me just wear uh, yourself out. So. Let me add something that uh, probably uh, no one else other than Neil would know this part of the story. When the program was created, there was actually planned to have the director and two full-time faculty members. That was the original plan for the program. Neil became the first, I became dean. And about that time, though, we made this political calculation. I don't know if this was after Don came or about then, but the political calculation was that that additional position that would come to Ag Law would actually be split up, in a sense, so that we could get other faculty members involved in teaching some of the courses. And that, again, was purely a political calculation because our thought was if we could get a number of the regular faculty teaching some class in the program, they would feel more uh, invested in the program. And so as a result, uh, Rob Leffler taught food law at one time. Mm, yeah. Linda Malone taught environmental law. Mary, uh, Mary Beth taught ag co-ops. Charlie Carnes uh, taught uh, labor. Ag, ag labor. And, yeah. and uh, tax, Lonnie Beard came on board. Yeah, we but, did the tax. Yeah. So that was a deliberate thing. That was really another uh, uh, slot that was supposed to be allocated to ag law, but we thought it would be better. And I think that probably was a wise move oh, because it I got agree. everybody kind of involved and more faculty who felt they had a part of the program. And I've got to tell you about Charlie Carnes. You may not remember this. A remarkable thing. 
here's uh, a man who taught on this law faculty for a good many years, and uh, I came rolling into town, and I had all this stuff that I was supposed to teach, and also I was supposed to write articles, and also I was supposed to administer the program. You know, 50% of my time on teaching, 50% administration, 50% research, <laughs> so it's that kind of a, a deal. Um, but um, uh, uh, I talked to Charlie about uh, ag labor, and he thought it sounded pretty interesting. So the very first year I was here, and I think maybe you were in that class, Charlie, Carnes agreed that he would come as a student into my class in agricultural labor, which he did faithfully, prepared the assignments, participated, call on him, you know, and so forth. I, I just, uh, you know, what a remarkable thing. And then he took it over. And I was, uh, well, it was an area I loved and, and uh, had done a lot of work on, uh, at least, you know, part of the load off my, my back. And I've always been grateful to, to Charlie, who's still around. Uh, I kind of almost hoped he'd been here today. But uh, um, he was one who was in on the, uh, those decisions uh, that, uh, that you were talking about, Jake. Uh, shall we have an LLM program? What shall it be? And so forth. I mean, there are still those who can uh, talk about that. But, uh, yeah, I think that uh, the, the idea of having... Uh, 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 wide faculty involvement uh, uh, strengthened uh, uh, the program, uh, more support. And in some uh, sense, we were doing the same thing with the College of Agriculture uh, uh, because in one way or another, I mean, it just wasn't Eric Wales and, and Ag uh, Econ, but uh, other members of the uh, faculty of the College of Agriculture came over to special lectures and so forth in, in, in the various uh, settings uh, because we wanted to have this uh, general acceptance in the, in the university. Uh, and I think it worked, worked pretty well. Uh, well, let's see. Um, I have to um, add one thing about uh, you know who's responsible for uh, success of this uh, this program, and um, when we get into that uh, topic, we come to somebody named Mary Berry. Now, Mary Jensen. Um, she was the first program secretary, and she was my personal secretary for several years. Uh, cheerful, organized, knowledgeable. She held the place together. Students first arrived, they, they met Mary, and they felt, well, they had problems, they'd go talk to her. Uh, and uh, her workload was great, but it seemed to me like she could run a calculator, the, the computer, and talk on the phone all at the same time, but uh, maybe that's a little exaggeration. And flirt with uh, Jack, too. Yes, uh, and I'm coming to that. Um, uh, and of course, she had to put up with my, you know, I was an old time lawyer in the law firm I was in. We didn't have computers. The idea that a lawyer would sit there fiddling on a computer, I mean, uh, I still to this day can't deal with that. Uh, I, I, in our firm, uh, uh, we had secretaries who, uh, who either could come into the office and take uh, sh uh, shorthand uh, dictation, or we had dictaphones. 
and I'd I got very good at this rattling off letters and articles and uh, so much briefs so and that uh, I've got to interrupt and tell this. <laughs> I was dean. Don came to me and said, are there any other dictaphones left in the building? I've worn out <laughs> all those I had. We scrounged around every closet we could find and found every old dictaphone we had and kept giving them to Don. And he'd wear the next one out. We'd find him another. Right, Jim? You help me. We dug around everywhere trying to find dictaphones for Don. Yeah. Well, I'd learned how to, you know, that's what we did. And our secretaries in the law firm, uh, they sat there with the earphones on. And you learned not only to dictate the text, but you dictated the punctuation and everything. And, uh, and the footnotes. They'd give you the draft, uh, you know, and mark it up, give it back to them. And it was amazing how much work you could get done using that method. Uh, uh, so, uh, you, uh, you know, Mary had to, uh, had to put up with, uh, with that because that's what I was doing. Um, and then came Jack Jensen, <laughs> LLM student, and took Mary away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if it was you, Chris, but somebody helped me in 1990 write the annual newsletter for the LLM program. I looked at that the other day, and he wrote to Jack Jensen, we will never forgive you for taking Mary to Kansas. <laughs> well. Chris, I, I, I hope you'll join with me now and after 20 some years. And we forgive you, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> uh, but you know, it uh, uh, can make a tremendous difference who you've got at that front desk who supports you, uh, uh, who keeps things organized. Uh, whether you're in a law office or in a law school. And uh, uh, Mary is no doubt the best thing that ever happened to Jack. And for a few years, I certainly was blessed by having her working for me. Well, where are we Talk at? about Dominica? <laughs> Where are we at? Talk about Dominico. He's here. Dominico. Dominico's Dominico's here. here. This is He's a good illustration of our international. Uh, you region know, of our uh, that's a, yeah. That, that, that's a good point to pick up on because early on in the program, we, we began to have um, uh, some visiting uh, scholars uh, come in. Uh, uh, I don't know if you remember Helge Wolf from the University of Copenhagen, who came here and spent a week, and uh, that was. Fascinating experience. Iqbal uh, uh, Hyder. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, uh, Malgozata Korzucha from the University of Warsaw in Poland spent several months with us, not as a degree candidate, but as a, um, uh, a visiting scholar. There were others. Uh, and, and Domenico uh, came uh, in, initially as a visiting scholar. And he liked us well enough uh, uh, that he uh, uh, enrolled in the program. Uh, Domenico is on the fa faculty of the University of Bari in, in Italy. He was still? Foggia. Foggia. Uh, and um, when I heard he was coming, I, I found this, my, my copy of Essays on the New Frontiers of American Agricultural Law, Domenico Vitti all the papers that he wrote in his different seminars and his non-thesis option paper. <laughs> 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 all here. Marvelous piece of work and wonderful to, to see you, uh, Domenico. Our first international student to come here to pursue the LLM degree was Heather Aldred. 
she was from the faculty of uh, Monash University in uh, Australia. And, uh, you know, how, how do we help finance her coming here, you know? Uh, and uh, that was at a time somewhere in the early 80s, I think, uh, when the law school really hadn't kind of gotten its first year legal writing program totally put together. <laughs> so we said, uh, Heather, you know, you come, you'll be in charge of the first year legal writing program. Uh, and so she came, and uh, it was kind of an overwhelming thing for her. I've always kind of felt kind of, kind of bad uh, about it. And she came here <laughs> knowing her father was uh, terminally ill, and he died in the f her fall semester. I was in the office when the fall, when the call came in the spring semester. Her mother had died. Uh, tough deal, but she was a uh, remarkable, remarkable woman, uh, and, and, our, and our first. Uh, uh, international student and we went on from there uh, uh, to students from Indonesia, from China, from Pakistan, Pakistan certainly, uh, Germany, Italy, Russia. Uh, oh what, what did you say? <laughs> Russia. <laughs> Russia, yes, Russia. Germany. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and if I could, Don, interrupt long enough, yeah. I, I'll, I'll give a short report. Some of you will remember our uh, romance that blossomed between oh. international students, b b between uh, Eric Strading, who is from the Netherlands, and uh, and uh, Henrietta, who was from Germany. And they both here were here at the same time and uh, ended up uh, getting married. And uh, they now own property in Polk County, Arkansas. And <laughs> come back every summer you know and and uh, so not only are they great representatives of the program they're near sort of honorary yeah. Arkansans so. oh yeah yeah Audrey and I hear from them yeah. uh, rather regularly uh, and, uh, yeah that's uh, well I you know I hate to interrupt but what I'd like us to do is continue this at our reception because we have some people that are anxious to meet with us and talk with us across the street in the university house. Susan, so. before uh, we move across the street, though, I, uh, I'll step in and hasten to add that uh, uh, we may have to wait 15 years uh, until we hey, have another reunion and recognize you for your 30 years. But <laughs> while people have had, had an opportunity, People have had an opportunity to hear from us. Uh, the important thing to know, and the students who were in my class this week and who came for this year, and many of the people here and going forward, uh, you've been the strength and heart of this program for 15 years, and under your leadership, it's matured and grown and progressed. And uh, I just want to thank you, I know, on behalf of all of us for organizing this but more importantly, doing what you do with the program. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.